At this point, we know that cells are the smallest unit of life, but they are made up of many non-living components that are essential for this emergent property of life to exist. And looking from the outside in, one of the first components that you will come in contact with when viewing a cell is its membrane. The cell membrane is a unique structure that is built off of one very important molecule, the phospholipid. These phospholipids are oriented in a way that creates a bilayer, or a two-layer membrane of phospholipids. In addition to phospholipids, there are many other substances embedded within the bilayer that serve specific functions and can contain both polar and nonpolar parts. Let's break down the details of the cell membrane and its many functions. As an obvious starting point, the cell membrane acts as a barrier. It is the structure that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell and has the ability to determine and control what substances are able to move in and out to an extent. We call this concept of substances being able to move across the cell membrane with different amounts of ease, permeability. So we can say that the cell membrane is permeable to some things, meaning they can pass through the membrane with less difficulty, and non-permeable to other things, meaning they generally cannot make it through. We can also say from the substance's perspective that some substances have a high permeability, meaning they can move through easily, or low permeability, meaning they can't. The permeability of a substance to move through the membrane generally depends on a few properties, like its size and its polarity. The orientation of the phospholipids within the bilayer has the polar heads facing out towards the external and internal parts of the cell, which is usually met by an aqueous solution, and between that sits the tails that are nonpolar. We call this the nonpolar core of the membrane. This nonpolar region makes it difficult for polar molecules or charged ions to move through, as they tend to be more attracted to the exterior solution and the phospholipid heads. If they get close to this region, their attraction to other polar substances will pull them away from the nonpolar region, resulting in them not passing through the membrane, making the membrane function as an effective barrier between the two aqueous solutions. Nonpolar substances, on the other hand, have higher permeability because they are attracted to this region and can therefore pass through it. When it comes to size, it's easier for smaller molecules to slip through the membrane than larger ones. So what you need to remember here is that small, nonpolar molecules have a much higher permeability than large polar molecules. A great example to compare is benzene and glucose. Benzene is a relatively small molecule that is nonpolar, and can move through the cell membrane, where glucose is a larger molecule that is polar and cannot. On the last slide, we discussed the concept of permeability and substances moving through the cell membrane. Carrying on with that same concept, when substances are able to successfully move through the membrane without any assistance from other structures, meaning they are literally moving between the phospholipids without any energy input, we call this simple diffusion. The term diffusion refers to the passive movement of particles from a high concentration to a low concentration, which occurs naturally without the input of energy. And the term simple refers to no other membrane structures being used in the process. We know from the last slide that small, nonpolar substances are permeable to the cell membrane, meaning they are moving in or out via simple diffusion. You need to know two examples of simple diffusion for the IB exam, which are the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Both of these molecules, O2 and CO2, are small and nonpolar. If there is a concentration difference between these molecules when comparing their abundance, both inside and outside of the cell, they will passively diffuse through the cell membrane via simple diffusion downstream of their concentration gradient. So if the aqueous solution outside of the cell had a high amount of oxygen relative to the inside of the cell that had a low amount of dissolved oxygen, the oxygen would diffuse in. We'll look at other examples of diffusion on the next few slides. So we know the cell membrane is made up of many phospholipids, but the reality is that there is so much more present in the cell membrane than just phospholipids. Membrane proteins play a large role within the cell membrane and have many different structural forms and functions. When we look at the orientation of the protein within the lipid bilayer, we can classify them as either peripheral or integral. 
The main difference between the two is that integral proteins are embedded into one or both lipid layers of the membrane, where peripheral proteins are attached to the surface of the bilayer. So as a visual example here, we can see that this is an integral protein that is attached to one lipid layer. This is an integral protein that is attached to both lipid layers and goes all the way through, which we call transmembrane proteins because they extend all the way through the cell membrane. And this is a peripheral protein attached to the surface of the membrane. The reason for these different membrane protein locations can be explained by their chemistry. Integral proteins contain at least one structural part that is hydrophobic, giving it the ability to interact with the nonpolar cell membrane core, where peripheral proteins are generally all hydrophilic, and their polar properties are repelled by the cell membrane core, which is why they cannot sit within the membrane. They are attracted to the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids on the exterior part of the membrane and can be anchored to the membrane by binding with a separate integral protein. The functions of membrane proteins include cell-to-cell -cell recognition, substance transport, enzymatic activity, intercellular joinings, and much more. We'll talk about those in more detail with specific examples on later slides and in other videos. Over the next few slides we are going to discuss how different substances can move across the cell membrane and a great place to start is with water. Considering that the human body and therefore the spaces inside and outside of our cells is made up of water by a large percentage, it only makes sense that water molecules should need to move across the cell membrane. Osmosis describes the net movement of water molecules across a cell membrane. And this process happens passively, which means without energy, and can be altered by concentration gradients of other solutes, or particles dissolved in water that exist both inside and outside of the cell. Even though water molecules are polar, they are small enough to move through the cell membrane via simple diffusion, which we discussed earlier. Some cells have additional structures called aquaporins that are integral protein channels that allow water to move across the membrane at a faster rate. As an example, some cells that make up your kidney tissue have large numbers of aquaporins to help absorb water faster when filtering your blood. Now we need to remember that the movement of water happens without energy through the process of diffusion. It can diffuse directly through the cell membrane or through an aquaporin. Solute concentration differences between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell drive the passive diffusion of water, which means there can be times when more water is moving in, more water is moving out, or about the same amount of water is moving in and out, which results in a net change of zero. What we need to understand here is that water molecules tend to spread out evenly when they contain dissolved particles. So if we had 10 water molecules and five sugar molecules, the water would not clump up together, but instead spread out and be evenly distributed among the sugar. The same concept drives the passive water movement across the cell membrane. Let's say that the cell has a high concentration of sugar molecules inside it compared to the outside, and therefore there is a low amount of water on the inside compared to the outside because the sugar is taking up more space. We call this a concentration gradient as there are different concentrations of a substance on either side of the cell membrane. Based on what we discussed so far, which way do you think the water will move, assuming that the sugar molecules do not have the ability to move through the membrane? If you said it will move in, you got it right. Water will always move down its concentration gradient, meaning it moves from high to low, or in this case, from the outside to the inside of the cell. If the concentration gradient changes, so does the water movement. In this case, there is a high solute concentration outside of the cell compared to the inside. So the water will move across its gradient from high to low, moving out of the cell. This case of water moving across the membrane often happens because the cell membrane is selectively permeable to some substances, meaning it does not let them through. This can cause a gradient to build up over time, which will force water to move across the membrane to spread out and be balanced. Gradients are a very, very, very important concept in cellular biology and are used to explain how many cellular processes work. We know that some things cannot move directly through the cell membrane bilayer, but with the help of specific transmembrane proteins, it is possible for polar molecules and ions to move through. Facilitated diffusion describes the passive movement, again, no energy here, of substances across the cell membrane through a protein channel, which is an integral transmembrane protein. We call this facilitated because the substances need the help of the protein channel to pass across the membrane. It is facilitated by the protein channel to cross. 
These protein channels include a pore that allows specific materials to move through. And because they move via passive diffusion without the use of additional energy, it is generally a concentration gradient that is nudging them to move either into the cell or out of the cell. These proteins are designed to specifically move only one substance through the membrane, and many of them possess an open and closed state which can either allow or inhibit the passive diffusion of particles. Examples of protein channels for facilitated diffusion include the aquaporins we discussed on the last slide and calcium channels. Calcium ions cannot move directly through the cell membrane, and therefore require the help of a protein channel to passively move. These calcium protein channels can be in an open or closed state depending on a voltage factor. We have talked a lot about passive transport up to this point, which does not require any input of chemical energy and has substances move from high concentrations to low concentrations down their concentration gradient. Active transport is the exact opposite of this. In active transport, Energy, mainly in the form of ATP, is used to move materials across the cell membrane against their concentration gradient, meaning from a low concentration to a high concentration. Much like we talked about with water and osmosis, molecules and ions tend to spread out and diffuse into space when given the chance. So if we are trying to put them all back together on one side of the membrane, which is against what they will naturally do, it requires energy. Examples of active transport that you need to know for the IB exam are that of specific integral proteins called pump proteins, which differ from the channel proteins we talked about earlier. Pump proteins can use energy, ATP, to move a substance against its gradient, meaning it moves across the membrane from a low concentration to a high concentration. It does this by restricting movement in only one direction, which is different from channel proteins that can move substances both in and out in both directions, and uses conformational change to do so. Let's use a common protein pump as an example to illustrate this process in action, called the sodium-potassium pump. This protein pump is used to move both sodium and potassium in specific directions to build a concentration gradient on either side of the membrane. It works to move sodium to the exterior and potassium to the interior of the cell. The process starts when three sodium ions attach to the protein, which stimulates the hydrolysis of ATP, using that energy to alter its shape and release the sodium ions to the outside of the cell. While still in this shape, or conformation, two potassium ions outside of the cell bind to other specific spots on the internal structure. This binding process releases the potassium left over from the original hydrolysis reaction, which causes the protein to revert back to its original conformation. It releases the potassium to the inside of the cell, and the process can start again. If we look at the gradients here, we can see that this pump is pushing sodium from a low concentration inside the cell to a high concentration outside of the cell. This is the function of active transport. We have already mentioned that the cell membrane is selectively permeable, but you need to know that this is only possible because of facilitated diffusion and active transport. Both facilitated diffusion and active transport are substance specific, meaning they are designed to only let specific substances pass through, which can also be at specific times. The calcium channel we discussed earlier is designed to only let calcium ions through and the sodium-potassium pump only has the structure to move those two ions. And it is the conformation of these proteins, whether they are opened or closed, that allows the membrane to be selective. If they are closed or not functioning, then those specific ions are not getting through, aka the membrane is selectively not permeable at that time. Contrasting this to simple diffusion, the cell does not have the ability to control the movement of specific substances. Size and polarity are factors in keeping some molecules or ions from moving across the membrane, but molecules that can move across it, like oxygen and carbon dioxide, can do so freely based on their concentration gradients at any time. In addition to channel and pump proteins, there are a few other components found within the cell membrane that you need to know about. These are called glycoproteins and glycolipids. The prefix glyco means pertaining to sugar, Think of the term glycogen, and when you add either protein or lipid as the base term, it describes a protein molecule that is bound to a sugar, 
or a lipid bound to a sugar. Glycoproteins can be embedded into the cell membrane with nonpolar parts of the protein found within the core of the membrane and the sugar components pointing out towards the cell's exterior. Glycolipids, in a very similar fashion, have a lipid part of the molecule embedded into the cell membrane core and the sugar portion pointing outward towards the aqueous exterior. Both of these molecules play a role in cell-to-cell -cell recognition, which allows cells to understand if other cells are pathogenic or invaders. These structures also allow cells to adhere to one another by fusing sugar components of one cell to another, which locks them in place. This is extremely important for creating multicellular structures like tissues in the human body. When referring to the cell membrane as a whole, the general consensus, and the way that scientists describe it as a model, is a fluid mosaic. The term mosaic refers to the many different parts that make up the membrane, like the phospholipids, integral and peripheral proteins, and more, and the term fluid refers to the ability of these components to move around within the cell membrane while still being attached and creating the bilayer. This means that the components of the membrane are not rigid or static, but instead have a degree of fluidity that can be altered by the components within the membrane. As the components of the cell membrane were being discovered, different models were presented to potentially explain and outline its structure. The fluid mosaic model, through scientific investigation and hard evidence, was coined the actual model that represents the true structure of the membrane as we know it.